walk down these halls. Where work feels like home. Swedbank. Coming home. Which one, the Ukrainian one or my, this is the Azov Steel one, so. Hello, 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 hello. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. <coughs> Is the mic working? Is the mic working? Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. I'll do one of the old-fashioned... <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Welcome, everyone. To this fascinating conversation that is not going to be only intellectual conversation with a title what do we die for what do we live for it's obviously not going to be only a wonkish uh, conversation even though as Constanza pointed out there are many very good intellectual foreign policy wonks in this in this room my name is Michal Baranowski I'm a managing director of GMF East I'm based in Warsaw um, so in that sense, I would be also uh, playing a role of a representative of the frontline state uh, in this discussion. Um, this, is, this is obviously not an intellectual discussion also because as we speak here, our brothers and sisters are fighting a bloody Russian aggression very nearby. They are dying. Uh, they are surviving, they are building the future of Ukraine. And in this room, we are protected by the, by the NATO's Article 5, that they are not, but we are also protected. I find myself often thinking that in Warsaw, I'm under not only the NATO umbrella, but also under the umbrella of the Ukrainian armed forces. So in this, uh, with this, I also want to 
recognize our colleagues from Ukraine here. I wanted to thank them as representatives of, the, of their society. There are many of you among us. I see Daria here, I see Hannah, I see Andre. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs> Without, without the bravery, uh, the tactical smarts of, uh, of Ukraine and Ukrainian people, our discussion here would be under totally different circumstances. In Estonia, in Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and other frontline states, where in Estonia, the foreign minister pointed out that is spending 3.2% on defense has contributed about 1% uh, percent of its GDP to defense, to military aid to, to Ukraine. We understand what is at stake. Um, and this is the discussion that we want to bring to um, uh, all of you. We will talk about the future of Ukraine, both in the short term, looking at the upcoming uh, counteroffensive. We'll look at the midterm, sort of what the Western societies are thinking how we can support the, the will among Western societies. But I also would love to get to the, to the challenge that Timothy gordon -Ash put forward uh, before us yesterday during the opening, opening panel, imagining Europe whole and free and at peace with Ukraine firmly inside, inside the tent, in it, and being really the key uh, pil pillars of the new Europe whole and free. With this, let me turn to our fantastic panelists. I'm not going to introduce each one of you because we have their bios in, the, in our booklet. Let me first turn to Andre, uh, who comes, uh, well, you, you have his bio, but he's, besides being a former Minister of Defense, Andre, you are coming after visiting the troops uh, on, in Donbass. The question I wanted to ask you is, as the counteroffensive is about to be launched, perhaps it's launched already, is U does Ukraine has what it needs? How have we, the West, have done in providing the weaponry for, for you to succeed? Andre, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this panel. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, uh, we are going to win this war. Ukraine is going to be victorious, and uh, we are uh, absolutely clearly intended to do so, uh, because there's no other way. Uh, Putin is not going to stop in any kind of uh, negotiations or any sort of like concessions. He's 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 clearly deemed uh, he's clearly uh, planning to destroy us. Uh, he doesn't see Ukraine in the map, and uh, we obviously make his plans fail. Actually, his plans are failing already because uh, all his campaigns so far, including the offensive which, has, uh, which they planned uh, in the wintertime, have failed. Uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, absolutely clearly intended to continue and uh, continue until this is a very clear victory. So, first of all. Uh, secondly, yes, this counteroffensive is going to start. Uh, we are getting ready for this. Uh, we are collecting the troops, we're training the troops, we're collecting the equipment, we are uh, doing the collective training and all that sort of things. It's probably going to start very soon, uh, based on what, what, what I could see. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, we, we do expect some success. Uh, clearly, just to, just to understand, the counteroffensive is not going to end this war. Mm -hmm. Certainly it will set a new pace, certainly it will, it will liberate some territories, as we expect. But uh, we need to understand that the amount of the uh, challenge which we face, it's, it, 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 that, that will take more time. So uh, some, we, we see that already there are some expectations that that would be it. Um, and that they, these are, th this is, I would say, a wrong approach. Uh, because uh, we see some of the, our allies, which we extremely appreciate for help, by the way. We, we received a, a massive amount of ass assistance. Uh, we received a, a huge amount of weapons. And uh, we're extremely grateful to our partners for that. Uh, but clearly, we need to plan also for some long-term capabilities. So we need to plan so for some capabilities which cannot be just in a matter of time set up for this, uh, this counteroffensive. So, for example, aviation. Uh, aviation takes time. I mean, it takes time to set up, it, it takes time to deploy, it takes time to train, to train the, uh, to train the mechanics and, and, and the pilots and so on and so on. And uh, uh, I would strongly suggest that we do not look at the with a short-termist approach to, the, to, 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 the, uh, to, to this war. Um, 
So, by said that, uh, of course, we, 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 we are much more ready than we used to be a few months ago. Uh, we certainly, it, obviously, when you're talking to military people, they're never ready, right? So, it, it's, it's never enough. I mean, the ammunition <laughs> is never enough, the equipment is never enough. Uh, they would always would, 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 would take more time and so on and so on. But, uh, um, but yes, we, we do have some substantial capabilities at hand at the moment. Great. We'll come back to, to how we did and what, you know, the timescales on, on different capabilities that, yeah. that should be delivered. But, but part of the conversation that we are having also in the first panel was about the, the uh, mindset and the strategy. And let me turn to Ambassador Kent, and I'm going to steal the question that Steve Began has uh, asked in the previous panel, uh, which is about, about U.S. strategy going uh, forward. U.S. has been uh, a leader of this coalition. Uh, frankly, uh, in Warsaw, we uh, w w imagine a world without the U.S., and we would worry about this world <laughs> very, very much if, if the U.S. was not providing the leadership uh, that it had so far. But what is the thinking going forward? What is the end game? What is the end strategy uh, that you are uh, pursuing as U.S. government, uh, given ambassador that you are representing the U.S. government in this, in this room? Thank you. If I can first say also thanks to all the Ukrainians in the room, we're talking about Ukraine with one Ukrainian and four Westerners. That's a little bit of West planning that's going to happen here. So one thing I will say on that is something that you've heard from U.S. leaders is that uh, Ukrainians will define uh, what uh, constitutes victory. Uh, Ukraine needs to win the war. They need to win the peace. I think Ukrainian leaders who are elected uh, will be the ones who define uh, uh, the end of the war after the Ukrainian army uh, uh, achieves victory on the field. I think it's actually going to be largely up to Ukrainian civil society, including many of the activists who are here, to define how Ukraine wins the peace. Our role is to enable that Ukrainian victory in both war and peace. And I think uh, if you look at the total numbers, those of us who worked on Ukraine uh, previously, uh, during the early years of the war, the war is in its 10th year, just to remind everybody, uh, it started in February 2014. Uh, I think the idea that the US would have uh, spent $37 billion in military assistance in 15 months for any country um, would not have been imaginable, even among the people who supported Ukraine. Uh, as an example or a, a sort of uh, reference, uh, we spent $72 billion in Afghanistan over 20 years, uh, giving assistance to the Afghan uh, security forces. We've done more than half of that in 15 months with Ukraine. In a similar way, after 2003 in Iraq, uh, Congress appropriated uh, $19, $21 billion, uh, in reconstruction assistance uh, by September, the U.S. will have given uh, $22 billion in economic assistance to Ukraine. So I think that's two parts. Part of it is resources. Obviously, part of it is systems. A uh, reference was made in the previous panel about the Ramstein process. Uh, U.S. and Ukrainian officials are in constant contact. Uh, Secretary Blinken was speaking to uh, Foreign Secretary Kuleba, uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba, yesterday, reinforcing our support for Ukraine's coming offensive, that's on the battlefield, as well as our support uh, for the pursuance of accountability uh, in the non-military track. So I think uh, it's working with Ukraine to support what Ukraine uh, is pursuing. And then we will work, continue to work with Ukraine on building a democratic, successful, prosperous uh, society, uh, secure in the borders of its international recognized territory, because Crimea is Ukraine. Here, here. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let me turn to uh, Mr. Lambsdorff. Um, it uh, it's almost looks like the timing of your visit here has been, uh, or the timing of the new German package has been uh, well coordinating yes. with, your, with your visit, <laughs> the biggest German uh, military aid to Ukraine so far. But I'm, I'm mindful, and I mentioned this, that the last time we met at this stage, a couple years ago, uh, uh, there, there was a question from the audience asking about threat perception. And, uh, and the, we, the threat perception that I mentioned from Poland was what we are seeing right now. And you at the time said, well, for Germany, the threat perception, the, the things that people really worry about is the disappearance of bees. Bees. Uh, not, not peace, bees. But bees. The little 
Right. Bienen. Bienen. Yes, Tom, Bienen. And that made for a very, um, a very good tweet. And this was, uh, this was pointing to, the, to Germany really looking beyond uh, uh, war and peace to climate change, to ecologi ecological change for its drivers of, uh, of um, security perception. So, has Germany changed? How far has Germany changed? And if I can just ask, ask this is will transition into the conversation about the will of the West. Uh, when you talk with your colleagues from the, from the parliament, when you talk with your voters, how committed Germany is to a long-term support for the, for the war effort and then peace effort, mm -hmm. like Ambassador pointed out, also rebuilding of Ukraine. Over to you. Yes, um, Michael, it's, it's really nice of you to remind me of this, this statement because it was true at the time and it's no longer true today. Germany has changed. Germany has changed in its uh, threat perception. Germany has changed in its attitude towards uh, military, uh, uh, the, the military dimension of conflict. Uh, Germany has changed in terms of its uh, commitment to uh, Ukraine because, frankly speaking, we didn't have much of a Ukraine policy beyond hoping that Minsk would somehow work. Um, so I think there is a fundamental change. The, 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 the change is, is encapsulated in one word that you all know, Zeitenwende, historic turning point is what, what Tim called it in, in, in his latest uh, Foreign Affairs article, a historic turning point, an inflection point if you want. And um, I, I just illustrate it for you briefly. I, I was the lead negotiator for international affairs in the coalition uh, negotiations for my party. And we had a, 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 a section on arms exports to crisis areas, okay? Arms exports to crisis areas. And it was a very tough negotiation with our partners in the, in, in, in the coalition. And at the end of the day, the, the coalition agreement reads, we're, we're going to be even more restrictive. We're going to be even more restrictive when it comes to exporting arms to crisis areas areas where some tension might flare up. With the Zeitenwende, with the new situation now, we have become the largest supplier of, of arms in Europe to Ukraine. We are exporting arms on a massive scale into a war zone. This from a country that has been sort of re-educated after the Second World War to think of you know, pacifism and, and, and liberal internationalism and institution building and, 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 and toning down on, on, on the military, particularly after unification, when our, armed, or our own armed forces were reduced dramatically. You know, in, in, in 1990, we had 800,000 German soldiers. Today, we have 180,000. It's, it's, I mean, we've, 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 we've scaled down our military dramatically. And now, the chancellor and the finance minister agreed three days after the invasion on that, that famous Zeitenwende speech, the Chancellor announced 100 billion euros for the German armed forces. Um, and I can only tell you that that change in Germany has gone so far that the latest package that was just announced today, which is really substantive, it's 2.7 billion euros, 30 main battle tanks, 100 uh, uh, armored trucks, I mean, uh, infantry fighting vehicles, all, it's not even creating a fuss anymore. It's not even creating a fuss anymore, um, except on the very extreme fringes of our political uh, landscape, whom we tend to dismiss. So, yes, Germany has changed. Germany has fundamentally changed. We are fully behind the effort of Ukraine to defend its territory against the invasion from Russia. Thank you very much. Um, let me, with that clear <laughs> statement from coming from Germany, let me turn to Tara, you, uh, and, and perhaps from a, from a position of a think tanker, poke some holes, give us a broader picture. You are, uh, you are currently in, at Brookings in Washington, D.C., but you, always, you were with ECFR in, in Paris, so you're bringing really the transatlantic perspective very, very well. If you could... If you could uh, give us your take on, on one hand, uh, the differences and similarities on the way that Americans and Europeans are looking at the war. But also, I think this is where we um, uh, should look at the, 
the, the, the will of the West uh, and, um, and the American component of it. So maybe if you could address with uh, one, uh, a minute or two the presidential campaign that has started in, a, in the United States, because it's not as easy for our American colleagues to comment on this, I, I learned, but there are lots of other Americans in, in the room. Um, <laughs> So over to you on how you are seeing the transatlantic similarities and differences and what we can expect from 2024 and Ukraine. Thanks a lot, Michal. Um, I'll make three quick points. On the US first, um, there's, there was clearly leadership, political and military, uh, brought out by the US very early on in the summer and fall of 2021. And I think a declassification campaign of information that led to actually uh, confirming that Vladimir Putin wanted to invade Ukraine, something that also in Europe we had trouble to believe for a long time in the face of, of intelligence. And we can come back to why we had troubles believing it. But the fact of the matter is there was very strong US leadership there. I think because the US saw it as an international security issue, uh, the US felt that it was a European security guarantor as well, but I think there was also the idea of upholding uh, the international order that the US was supporting since the end of World War II. So what we saw was very clear leadership from the US, also in trying to bring the European leadership there too. Uh, and so I think for me, what we've seen in the US in the current political debate is that lines are shifting a little bit. We see more and more articles about the fact that there would be war fatigue coming from the population, something that we've been hearing both in the US and Europe, I would say from the very first days of the war. Very early on, we were warned that the populations would not support the support that we were providing Ukrainians. Until now, we've been proven wrong. Mm -hmm. Actually, populations in the US and in Europe were very supportive of the efforts that yeah. we were bringing about. This seems about to change because of the current political context in the US. And of course, it's being used and instrumentalized, uh, particularly by the Republican Party. Donald Trump, I think, trying to set himself uh, as the legitimate Republican candidate for 2024, has been very clear that he thought we should end support to Ukraine. A few days ago at uh, the CNN town hall, he said that if he were to be president, um, he would bring Volodymyr Zelensky and Putin together and end the war in 24 hours. Ron DeSantis tried to follow his lead a little bit and got a lot of pushback from part of the senior Republican leadership who were on a more well, you know, traditional transatlantic view that they needed to support Europe. But there is, um, I would say, a lot of ambiguity right now. Clearly, Ukraine is going to be a foreign policy issue in the 20, 2024 presidential debate. And as Europeans, we should be very conscious of that. And let me turn to my second point now. For Europeans, this is existential. The Estonian foreign minister said so very eloquently in the previous panel, and I think that makes a difference because it means that the victory of Ukraine is actually existential to the survival of Europe. We have, I would say, a different stake here. And my sense is there has been um, an awareness of this on the European side massive NATO coordination in providing weapons to Ukraine, very clear statements that we were going to be with Ukraine until its victory, until the end, that we would do what it takes. There is also ambiguity there, but I think the fact that we're repeating it is also a clear message. Um, and I know that's not enough, but you know, I don't think we should underestimate what Europe has done, what the EU has done. Um, the fact that there is the European peace facility mechanism and that we're providing Ukraine. Again, there are individual member, member states donations, military donations, but we're trying to organize it in, in a European way. Proposition coming from this country that there should be joint procurement in ammunition and missiles given to Ukraine that has been approved. And another pro proposition uh, that we should actually jointly produce together. This is quite a paradigm shift for a project, as the Lithuanian foreign minister said yesterday which was a peace project initially. The very idea of Europe was that we were never supposed to go to war together, that there would be no more great power competition. So we have shifted, and clearly the victory of Ukraine is absolutely indispensable to the future of Europe. Very quick final point. I think the rest of the world also uh, has a stake in Ukraine's victory. Um, I think we were very surprised as European and Americans to see that not you know, not all the world was shocked that Russia had invaded, uh, that there were denunciations of Western hypocrisy uh, and double standard, and that we were expecting as the West that the rest of the world would follow us on this. <coughs> to be fair, if you look at the votes uh, resolutions at the UN General Assembly, an overwhelming majority of countries actually voted in favor of the resolutions condemning Russia. But we were expecting more vocal support to Ukraine that we haven't heard until now. I think there are many reasons for this. Uh, 
clearly the war in Ukraine is a colonial war from Russia, but when it's former colonial powers making this argument, I think it's not heard as clearly. What I am seeing, though, is that when Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi or Chinese President Xi Jinping at the time, it's not the case so much anymore, but when they voice publicly their concerns to Putin, he's actually forced to address these concerns as publicly as they did. At the Shanghai Cooperation Summit in the fall, Putin was forced to say that he heard these concerns. Because when India and China say this and others, it completely quashes the argument that this is the West against the rest. And my sense is that there are a number of countries from the BRICS, Brazil, South Africa, but countries from the G20, G77, who have actually a lot more strategic agency, strategic capacity to act than they give themselves credit for. It makes a huge difference when they speak up. And they shouldn't speak up because we're asking them to, but clearly because there is a sense for us. You know, we're, we've been talking about whether we need peace or justice in the, in the end of the war to Ukraine, but, but if they do want peace, actually they have something to say to Putin, and Putin, I think, would listen to them differently. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And, and also making the, the um, <coughs> enlarging the context to the, to the global context that we mentioned in the, in the, in the previous, uh, previous panel as well. Um, Sam, you have written quite a bit about um, how the war should end. Victory in, in Ukraine has been mentioned a number of times. We talked about what Ukraine is getting. We talked about what Ukraine needs. How, what are your thoughts on the development of the war and how, we, how this actually can succeed in, uh, in bringing Ukraine to the, to the Europe whole and free and at peace that, we, that uh, Timothy gordon put at the beginning of the conference as, a, as our political goal at the end of this, this terrible mess that we are in right now? Well, thanks, Mikhail. Um, and you know, I should clarify that uh, I'm, I'm not going to be using the word "should" um, in this context. Uh, I think because you know, my view of ideal war outcomes, um, you know, are, is a full restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity, justice for war crimes, uh, restitution, Ukrainian EU and NATO membership, uh, Russia repenting for what it has done, and. Um, renouncing the use of force and spheres of influence, but we don't live in an ideal world. Uh, and so as an analyst, I think my job is more uh, today to talk about um, what I think are the most plausible outcomes based on uh, the evidence we have from the last uh, 15 months of, of, of this uh, horrible war. Um, and so I would agree with Andre just uh, at the top that um, this uh, counteroffensive is unlikely to change the fundamentals. But I would go further um, and say that territorial shifts or in territorial control, uh, generally speaking, in the forthcoming months of war, are unlikely to shift the fundamentals of the conflict. Um, and that's uh, you know, grounded in some of the history about how interstate wars end. And usually, th they don't end when one side's forces are pushed beyond a certain point on the map. Um, in other words, Territorial conquest, or reconquest um, in this case, is not a form of war termination. So even if uh, Ukraine were able to succeed in pushing uh, Russian forces completely uh, out of its internationally recognized territory, um, we should not expect that uh, Moscow would necessarily stop fighting. There's no reason to believe that that is necessarily the case. Um, but I think we can see other aspects of how this uh, conflict will develop over the long term coming into, coming into view uh, 15 months in. I think the location of the front line is an important piece of that, but it's not the only one. Um, and in fact, it's probably not the most important piece. Uh, the most important, I, I would argue, in the years to come are two persistent aspects that um, both, both sides of this war are going to be able to pose a threat to each other indefinitely. Um, and that, uh, um, that the, the unsettled dispute over, that caused by Russia's annexation or attempted annexation of uh, parts of Ukraine um, will, will persist. Um, because I think it is clear now that neither side, even with external assistance, has the uh, ability to destroy the other's military completely. Um, and Ukraine, of course, has built a tremendous and impressive fighting force. Uh, and the Ukrainian armed forces will pose a permanent threat to any areas under Russian occupation and to undisputed Russian territory, as we've seen with uh, Ukraine's uh, consistent ability to strike uh, within Russia that it has demonstrated over the past months. 
Um, but I think the same is true for the Russian military. Although it has suffered significant losses that will take years to regenerate, uh, this is not a military that is going to uh, disintegrate um, as a function of the fighting in Ukraine. Um, they, even in their current sorry state, can cause significant death and destruction for both Ukrainian military and civilians. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll maintain sea, air, and ground-based strike assets that can hit Ukraine cities at any time. So the point I'm making is that really no matter where the line is, that Russia and Ukraine will both have the ability to pose a permanent threat to each other, um, and, but that neither will have the capacity to achieve a decisive victory. Um, of course, even when Russia's forces were in far better shape in 2022, they couldn't take control of Ukraine. Um, and at this stage, even taking control of the areas that they claim to be part of Russia seems beyond their uh, capacities. But that, those limitations suggest that um, neither side will uh, end up achieving their territorial objectives uh, using military means, um, which suggests that the war will likely end without um, common agreement among, between the belligerents on um, the, the territorial questions. So. Uh, either or both of Russia and Ukraine will have to settle for a de facto line of control that, not, that neither recognizes as an international border. Um, and I think that that is a very unsatisfactory outcome, um, but it is one that is likely to persist over the long term. And really, it seems to me that the question is about the, uh, essentially, how much death and destruction we're going to have before we get to the point where that um, where we reach, uh, where, where a sustainable ceasefire um, plausibly could be negotiated. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Thank you very much. So you outline, uh, I would argue, one of the possible scenarios, but you argue it uh, well. And I could see that Andre wants to uh, address it. Uh, so, and, uh, Andre, if you could also address in this your vision yep. of the of the victory, because we foc Sam focused very much on the territorial aspect of it. Uh, over to you. Okay, um, I have to say that our disagreement with Sam didn't start five minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> we know it's been it's been it's been going for a while, and uh, obviously. Uh, as in some other stages, I mean, there's been a, a number of true facts stated and then the wrong conclusions. So uh, the true facts are that indeed we are understanding that uh, Russia will, even if Russia is pushed or when it's pushed uh, outside of Ukraine, it still would pursue a threat. And that's true. And that, that is absolutely true. And we need to be ready for that. Uh, what, what, what we clearly need to understand is that th that fact does not mean that we shouldn't do that. That fact doesn't mean that we shouldn't be pushing Russia's out. Secondly, question whether we can push Russia out or not. Well, we did this with a few, more than 50% of the territory they occupied since 24th of February. So uh, by, by experience, yes, we can. And, uh, and we saw Russia running, uh, and also we've seen them running in an uncontrolled way, basically like in panic, so, uh, which Ukraine hasn't done. And, uh, and, 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 and this means that we know that Russian army is not that invincible as, it, as, it, as it's supposed to be, as it's kind of a considered for, 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 for many, many analysts and for many politicians and so on. So the question is like, where do we see realistic outcome of this in a sort of a medium term perspective? Obviously, Ukraine has to be liberated. I mean, because as soon as Russia maintains a foot in Ukraine, the threat from a uh, from certain degree becomes like 100%. And that, be, that means that they would, be, uh, they would be reinforced to continue. They would be uh, treating that sort of holdings as, the, uh, as, a, as, a, as a demonstration of their ability. And more importantly, they would avoid a very clear failure. And the political goal of all our coalition, which has been told in this conference only, like many, many times, is that Russia fails. Russia cannot get out of this conflict thinking that it has succeeded in something. Because that destroys the whole purpose of what we're doing here altogether. So it needs to fail, and it needs to fail without any doubt whatsoever. So nobody has to be in a doubt that Russia like, dramatically failed. Now, we're not saying that uh, our next session will be in the Red Square, you know, where we will be celebrating. Uh, uh, not, necessarily, not necessarily. However, I do believe that Russian re uh, Putin's regime will fail as well, eventually. But what we need to make sure is that they are deterred from the ability to, uh, to start what sometimes we call it the season two, basically, you know, like in, mm -hmm. in films, you know. So, 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 yeah, because that's what they will try to do. 
uh, in, uh, in, in whatever option. And we need to use that time, whatever the time we will have, and uh, use the support that we'll have, to build up an, a common uh, force which would deter the for, for further uh, relapses. And that, 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 that's very clear. Uh, and I, yes, I'm, we, I am and our government and most of the like, absolute majority of our people are extremely skeptical about the, when, when negotiations are mentioned. And let me explain why in, in, in one sentence. Because we tried already many, many times. We've been negotiating with Russia, with Minsk uh, process for, for, for years and years and years. Uh, whoever forgot, a year ago we had a negotiation team working with Russians trying to find a yeah. solution. Only to see that at that very time they destroyed the city of Mariupol of 500,000 people once, uh, completely r into rubbles without letting the civilians out by encircling it with the, with the land forces. So, uh, so we did try, and we, we clearly understand that uh, Putin can only use negotiation only to kind of drag the time, in order to fool everybody and then prepare for this, for this, for this, for the new, for the new campaign. And uh, so that's why we are skeptical about this. And we understand that with, in some wars, yes, many wars ended with negotiations, that's true. But any historian can say that not all wars ended with negotiations. And it's not like we don't want peace. We want peace more than anyone else in this room. Uh, we are not enjoying that. We're not like having fun of, uh, of, of, of having this war. But uh, we need to be realistic. And if we want peace, we need to be very realistic what actually brings peace. Concessions and sort of softness is not going to bring peace with Putin. He's not that type of, type of a person. Let, let me do a, one more follow-up, and I want to bring the audience and other panelists as well. But with, to, to get this outcome, what do you need from the other panelists? <laughs> what do you need from the West to bring this, this outcome? And do you have a sense that you have the political and time space to, to do that? Or do you feel, on the other hand, under pressure to deliver on this counteroffensive and then enter unequal, uh, imperfect negotiations? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think any of the, our key allies will actually be pushing Ukraine to negotiations. I don't think, I don't think that's realistic because we, yeah. we, we talk to our political policymakers and I don't think that, I mean, most of the policymakers are very sober about where, where we are. So they all understand this very well. Uh, what we what we do need is we need to uh, for the for for for, uh, for our political coalition for the well some people call it Rammstein coalition or whatever so the coalition of the key partners providing Ukraine with capabilities actually have a clear definition of the political goal of that coalition so where are we actually going and they need to and and we need to uh, stop being a short termist in a way you know mm -hmm. and and thinking about the next couple months only, mm -hmm. but actually to think a little bit in a, a, ahead. Because Russia exactly using that vulnerability in its strategy. They're expecting the West to be tired, fatigued. Mm -hmm. We obviously heard fatigue first time a year ago in May. Yeah. Uh, that's the first time some journalists started to call and say, yeah, we have a fatigue. I said, thank you. I mean, uh, look at I mean, we, we, while we're kind of dealing with this, I mean, you're already tired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so that fatigue story goes, goes for a while, uh, but the, 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 the truth is that uh, uh, it, it doesn't make things easier, you know. Mm -hmm. We need to get this through, and we need to understand, and you obviously, if you don't know where you're going, you won't get there. So for our coalition, we need to have a common vision, and that common vision needs to prevail, uh, and then resources would become a, more like a technical matter rather than the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, more, more than that. Thank Let you. me follow up with this uh, directly to Mr. Lambsdorff and, and an ambassador for, in few words, your definition of the vision uh, from perspective of Germany, from the perspective of the, of the U.S. Um, please. Well, it's, it's quite interesting. You mentioned uh, a Europe whole and free and at peace. Just this week, literally this week, there was a ceremony in Berlin honoring George Herbert Walker Bush who coined this phrase, the, the American president at the time of German unification and, 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 and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it was, it was quite interesting. We discussed the concept. What does it mean? And, and for us, as I said earlier, in the past, Germany at least didn't have a very pronounced Ukraine policy beyond hoping that Minsk would work. Uh, now this has changed completely. Europe whole and free and at peace includes Ukraine inside the European Union. The chancellor has been absolutely unequivocal about this. Um, and there are some people, uh, and, and it's a growing chorus in Germany, uh, saying that Ukraine should also join NATO. And the argument for that is uh, drawn from Henry Kissinger, 
who said when, you know, when Ukraine was rejected in 2008, the purpose of that at the time was to avoid a war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The war is now there. Mm -hmm. So the very purpose of the rejection has proved moot. And therefore, the vision, Europol and free and at peace, would include a Ukraine firmly anchored in Euro-Atlantic institutions. That's at least what many people in Germany now think, and that, which I think is also going to be the gist of Germany's uh, Ukraine policy over the coming months. There's no consensus on the NATO part, but there is clear consensus on the EU part already. And my personal expectation is that the discussions on, on NATO will also move in the same direction. Mm. Ambassador, what is DC thinking? I will actually uh, go to the point of uh, perhaps trying to speak a little bit on the American people. Uh, mm -hmm. I think politicians uh, can vote and uh, say whatever they want, but I was struck uh, traveling uh, through the US last year, visiting relatives and tracking my heritage. Um, I've never seen as many Ukrainian flags flying across the United States. I don't think I've ever seen any other country's flags flying as frequently as uh, Ukrainians flagged last year. And that's not just around Washington. I drove through South Carolina down to Florida. There were a lot of uh, houses in rural South Carolina that had a Trump flag and a Ukrainian flag. Uh, that suggests that they vote one way, but they still support Ukraine. And I think it's, is a challenge. It's a, well, it's a reminder that people vote for a variety of reasons. And democracy and people who vote ha can hold two opinions at the same time and Absolutely. don't endorse everything that a, a certain leader wants. So I think that's on the issue of support. I think uh, you can, again, poll politicians, uh, but I think if you look, a majority of Americans still support Ukraine firmly. In terms of policy, uh, since my former professor, Elliot Cohen, mentioned Clausewitz, uh, Clausewitz's triangle of leadership, army, and people, uh, I think too many people analyzed uh, the military balance and focused only on numbers. They didn't understand the importance of leadership, and they didn't understand the, pur the, pur uh, the point of purpose, in this case, of the Ukrainian people, uh, who didn't just have the moral right, but they understood that this was also existential. Uh, the mayor of Tartu, since there are a lot of Tartu alums here, uh, told me in February that what happened in uh, last year, about 100% of the construction workers in Tartu uh, were Ukrainians, and construction stopped because 90% of them went back to fight for their country. And so I think it's a reminder, even as uh, Estonia now has 5% of its resident population being Ukra Ukrainian refugees, some Ukrainians that were working here went back to defend their country. And so that, that, that clarity of purpose on Ukrainians is there. That's something that obviously we have the moral imperative to support. And that far exceeds any motivation, even fear, or the uh, fear of being shot in the back uh, of those who are serving in the Russian army. So I think, and, and what crafting our strategy, we have to be thinking in multiple phases, just like anyone who does with a budget. You're spending money in the current phase, you have to plan for the next year, and you strategically have to know where you want to be in five years. If you look at the U.S. announcements the last two weeks, this week 1.2 billion, last week 300 million, these numbers now people are numbed to the uh, uh, levels, but keep in mind in the first eight years of the war, uh, the U.S. gave only 2 billion, 2.6 billion, uh, and a lot more in the last 15 months. Um, when Tony Blinken announces drawdowns, that's stuff we're putting on planes and sending uh, to Ukraine now. Uh, when the uh, Department of Defense announces the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, those are contracts. So the 1.2 billion announced this week was contracts. Those aren't going to come this spring. That's part of our plan for uh, uh, equipping Ukraine this fall, next spring. We can come back here next year, guaranteed, and talk about the war in 2024 because it's not ending in the next couple of months. So we have to have clarity of purpose of where we want to go. And we have to understand that we have to be planning for the immediacy of now. And uh, the US government believes that air defenses is the absolute critical need. Obviously, long range fires are important. And I know a lot of people in this room feel strongly about the F-16 coalition. Thank you for the t-shirt, Daria. Um, and uh, <laughs> the answer from President Biden recently was not yet, which is not no. Uh, mm -hmm. And so again, there, I think the, we all have to have this capacity to act and plan uh, in multiple phases, and keep in mind that we're supporting the elected leadership of Ukraine, we're supporting the army and the soldiers who are fighting and dying, and we're supporting Ukrainian society, which will make uh, the country a better place to live after the war is finished. Thank you very much. Uh, and Tara, I want to ask you to actually put on your French hat for a, 
for a moment of beret. I can be so uh, <laughs> stereotypical. And you know, I mean, if France is an important uh, part of this this puzzle, it's been relatively. Uh, quiet or sometimes very loud and confusing actor. Uh, so if you if you could also uh, try to address the question of the strategic end goal from the French perspective, because uh, you, when you talked about Europe, you 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 know you sounded like you are from Warsaw, uh, a, a existential uh, uh, aspect of the war. So yeah, uh, you know, t tell us how how this how this strategy is viewed from Paris. So I think you know. Um, there are a number of military donations that France doesn't want to talk about. It's been French, for, for, you know, French policy since the beginning of, of the war. There are donations that France does want to t talk about. The Ukrainian military uh, sometimes has been communicating about it. But I think there has also been a change in terms of the French perception of its own role uh, in European security here, and there has been an evolution. Um, you see a lot of coordination inside, uh, I would say, the French system, and coordination with European allies too. And declarations uh, by Macron, some of them can be confusing, some can be very clear and unequivocal support to Ukraine, the need for Ukraine to win. Uh, Macron's advisor previously also said this in just the previous panel right now. I think France has a clear stake in Ukraine winning because France is part of Europe and Ukraine will be part of Europe. And now basically our fates are intertwined. So I think, you know, we discussed military donations. I think we'll still need to do uh, a lot of coordination with NATO allies as well, and this will have to continue, but we'll need to start talking about reconstruction as well very mm -hmm. soon. And this is something that the French are talking about, but other, others in Europe too, because I think as we're planning the mid and long term, we also need to think about how we ensure that we're participating directly in Ukraine's reconstruction again, because the future of Ukraine rests in Europe, and so the future of Europe also rests in Ukraine. And this, I think this is quite clear from the French side still. We don't, you know, we can get later on in a bit more in, in, in details and what Macron meant, but I think when it comes to Ukraine, he's been actually quite clear here, and France is very engaged and committed to that. So um, maybe we need to clarify. I hope that has clarified it. I am not a French official, so this is just my <laughs> own view. But uh, you know, I'm a French European. I think we've also seen quite a a shift in terms of France wanting to be a lot more pro-European, mm. affirming it talking about European sovereignty. And so a number of issues here are also about Europe becoming stronger, Europe be being serious about its defense and about being serious about defending Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much also for bringing the subject of reconstruction, which I hope to get to during Q&A perhaps a little bit more because you know this is in the end about winning the peace and, and the um, coordination of the reconstruction process has started with the with the G7 uh, mm. process, uh, and you know, Andre, we, when we have come back, if you can help us think through uh, the um, Ukraine, Ukrainian perspective and, and timeline uh, for the for, for the reconstruction, I'm mindful that we are at 45 minutes, so please prepare your questions. But I want to give some a chance to, uh, well, weigh in, okay. um, perhaps on on what was said in the beginning of the second round. So um, I guess I'll, I'll continue our discussion with Andre <laughs> um, now that we're on the same stage together. It's been in print, uh, so it's more intimate, I suppose. Um, so in my view, Russia has already failed. And really, that there's no plausible development in the course of the war that could reverse that. This has been a strategic catastrophe for Russia on any number of different levels, economic, military, in terms of its global prestige, its regional influence. I mean, you could keep going and going and going. I think all of that is essentially locked in, um, that in terms of plausible developments uh, in the uh, um, going forward, um, that really, that that's not going to change as a result of um, uh, ways you could see the pl plausibly see the battlefield developing. So it is certainly desirable um, I would agree with Andre to that Russian forces get pushed across the international border by uh, by the Ukrainian military, but the point I was trying to make is just that that will mean that then the line of contact is the international border, not that the war ends. So uh, territorial reconquest is desirable, but it is not a form of war termination, and I think that is the point that we need to get used to. That in that scenario, hopeful as it sounds, the war is not going to be over. Um, and finally, 
I agree with Andrea that the, uh, the prospect of a MINS-3 is something that we should be using all the possible policy tools that exist to avoid. And so that means thinking through right now, what combination of long-term security assistance to Ukraine to develop an effective uh, deterrent um, and make the cost of a potential future Russia aggression too high, what combination that would include uh, as well security uh, commitments, if not guarantees, um, in the context of an end to the, uh, this phase of the hot war, would make any potential end to the fighting be enduring so that Ukraine would not have to face um, a second season, as Andre put it. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. That's a good way to begin our Q&A. I see uh, Ambassador McFall here, if we can start. And there is about 10 questions already. Uh, please raise your hands as well. <laughs> I have some of you, and I'll be in entirely unfair uh, because I will have to just choose. Uh, Mikhail, Sir. actually, I have 15 questions myself. Excellent. So, uh, <laughs> I should have started with someone else. Yes. So, uh, uh, Michael McFall, professor at uh, Stanford University. Um, uh, my question is really for Andri. Um, uh, on the long term, it sounds like everybody agrees what we want. On the long term, I think there's been a lot of good work about how you get there more and better weapons, more and better sanctions, give the 330, $365 billion sitting in our accounts of the Russian Central Bank to Ukraine now for reconstruction, and, we, and declare Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. All of that is for the long term. Mm -hmm. And if we get another round and I get to ask a second question about the long term, I'll do so. I'm guessing I'm not going to get it that chance. Um, Andrea, I want to hear from you, and no disrespect to everybody else, but what we die for, your country is the only people dying. so. My question's addressed to you, others can jump in. We got wrong, analysts got wrong. Fantastic what the, what the CIA and all our friends did in terms of telling the world that Putin was gonna invade. We got fantastically wrong uh, estimating what they were gonna do in the beginning of the war. We got, we got a lot of things wrong in terms of uh, estimating and predicting where the borders are to Sam's point, uh, or not. I wanna hear from you, what in your view are we not focusing on mm that gives you hope about the counteroffensive, the things that we're not paying enough attention to. And second, tell us if you want to, and if it's strategically uh, not wise, don't tell us. <laughs> things that worry you. And the second part of that question is help us, me, like an analyst, right? Mm -hmm. Help us define victory and defeat in the coming months. Because this is, you know, what is victory and what is defeat? It's not, you don't go to some blue book and say, oh, you won, you lost. It's all in the eyes of the beholder. How many times have we seen the headline? I think David Sanger's still here. Uh, Russian counteroffensive massively defeated uh, in the winter, right? That's what you just said. I haven't seen that headline. So help us, number two, uh, on uh, how we should define victory and defeat in the short term. I'm not interested in the long term. I want to know in the short term. If, well, we, if we're looking at Andrei, the can we, uh, yeah, please, can, sorry. Let's, let's take a couple questions, because sure, otherwise yeah. we will. I, I have Marie uh, here. Yes, yes. Thank you. Marie Madras from Sciences Po University in Paris. Um, we've been saying this morning several times that Ukraine must win the war and win the peace. We know that the Russian leadership does not want peace. They have absolutely no plan for peace. And that's their logic. It's a logic of death and annihilation. In, if, if we all agree on this, the only way we can have peace is achieve the total surrender of the Russian regime militarily and politically. Why do you not don't you put on the table total surrender. Thank you. Was there a question to a specific person? Well, I guess Andre, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> we'll come back to this side. <laughs> I, I, Natalie Tochi uh, Thank in, you. The, in the center. Uh -huh. Thank you, Natalie Tochi. Um, Sam, I think, you're, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right in saying we should try and separate desire from analysis. Um, where, though, I think the problem in your analysis lies is, you know, when you say, well, ultimately, where the line uh, will be drawn, yes, it's going to be significant, but it will, doesn't detract from the fact that it will end in negotiation. And 
and, and I'm thinking to, my, thinking it to myself, well, if that line is, for the sake of argument, the 1991 borders, um, i.e. if Russia, or perhaps not even necessarily that, but if that line is, um, sort of leaves Russia with less than what it had uh, when its large-scale invasion began, and on top of that, having lost you know, hundreds of thousands of men and sanctions that will remain forever and ever, surely that at some point, and perhaps not immediately, I mean, you know, as I think you rightly say, losing a war does not necessarily mean that you're going to stop fighting it uh, the next morning. So there may be a time lag there, but eventually there it will be politically consequential in Russia. We don't know exactly when and exactly in what form, but assuming analytically that there will be some sort of steady state in which Russia will simply keep on doing what it's doing regardless of where that line is, I think analytically just simply doesn't hold water. Okay. Well, well let's, let's start answering mm -hmm. the questions and we'll come back through here. Andre, first to Yes, you. thank you very much for questions. Uh, so obviously we do consider the surrender as an option. And uh, <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are working very hard on uh, like exit, implementing that option. And, uh, and we will really welcome if uh, Russian government finally wakes up with the reality and understand that they, they are clearly going to fail and, uh, uh, and, 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 and actually do something about their leader. Uh, personally, I don't think Putin will do that, uh, just based on our understanding of his character. But Putin is not like going to be there forever. And who knows, maybe that not forever would come much earlier than he expects. Uh, which we're also working about because we are delegitimi delegitimizing his position in the eyes of the whole community, of, the, of everybody. Uh, people, people of the whole world have to understand that what kind of a person that is. Um, and, uh, and yes, and obviously Russia is going to a substantial difficulties, not just in the military sphere, but all others, including social, including economic. And by the way, I've seen a lot of the uh, analysts and the policy makers in Europe really scared of that option. They were saying, oh, we don't know what's going to happen with Russia after the failure and so on. But certainly, uh, yes, this is something to, to think about, but it's certainly not something to avoid by any means, because, because they need to fail and we should not be scared of the victory. And when I'm saying we, I mean the, 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 the democratic coalition. Um, so, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, th regarding uh, M M Michael McFall's question. So, first of all, uh, indeed, we need to un understand who we deal with. We, we're dealing with a very seriously shattered army, I mean, the, the Russians. And, but they still have lots of people. They still have lots of uh, uh, certain, some innovations. They have still lots of weapons. Even if they're old, there's a lot of them. By the way, one of the, one of the lessons of this war, which we should... The lessons of this war, we should, we should capture, record, think through, because they will help to stabi for stability for the, for the whole world. So one of the lessons is that the premise that the wars of the future will be like small, high-tech, only high-trained uh, trained, uh, manpower, you know, with the, with the super like, precise weapons. It, this, this premise is likely not, not the case. I mean, because we, we see the war where they're just sending hordes of people to die, and then they die and then send more, and then they die and then send more, and something you would rather see in a, like a zombie movies, you know, rather than in the in the books which been just recently published about the war. The books I've, I've read mo many of them, you know, and they did not describe these scenarios. They describe scenarios of like, cyber AI, etc. Uh, they're not describing Wagner tactics when they're just sending convicts to die, you know. So we need to, uh, yeah, so we need to realize who we deal with. And yes, the fact that we disabled them from the opportunity to realize the, uh, implement the, 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 the um, yeah, offensive in the wintertime, that's a great achievement, I think. But yes, we just, I mean, the, 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 uh, most of people just take it for granted because it never happened. But it was planned to happen. And they prepared for this, for some, some substantial forces. Uh, same thing goes with the uh, massive campaign. They wanted us to freeze to death. And they were talking about, we watched their TV, you know, like, uh, not, not very pleasant experience, I have to say, but uh, we have to. And they were seriously discussing, like, like children and, and, and all the people would die from, uh, from, uh, from the frost in the wintertime, you know, as a, as a strategy. That never happened, but it was a serious uh, effort of our air defense, of our energy infrastructure, rescue services, and so on and so on. Uh, so yes, and then uh, uh, regarding the uh, uh, regarding what we kind of uh, wish West does more. So of course, uh, of course, we uh, there are a number of cases when the weapons which we've been asking for for a year uh, were provided, but were provided way later than we expected. 
And, and often, like, and we spend enough time in Western capitals, we discussed it, we understand the logic, and, and so on and so on. But some logic is very difficult to understand, uh, with all due respect. So, for example, like escalation uh, theory is a very ambiguous theory. And there is no book like where written what is escalatory or what's not. And if it was escalatory yesterday, but today it's not, like what have changed? Uh, the fact that escalation happened, so we were, we were to wait until that happens so it be doesn't become escalatory. Maybe it wasn't escalatory from the very beginning. Uh, so, for example, there have been, uh, not, n the, the planes weren't provided, like even, even, even the Allied Soviet planes weren't provided because it was escalatory. Now it suddenly isn't. Uh, the, the tanks, the whole saga about the tanks and so on and so on, it took an immense, uh, you know. And it's not like we started to talk about tanks in, in, in December. No, it was a discussion for a long time. So perhaps it would make sense to, uh, to, to be uh, braver about the, uh, you know, about, about the outcome, because from a military planning perspective, it's, it's rather straightforward. We need to have a common goal of the strategic outcome of, this, of the war. We need to have a strategic plan. We need to have a campaign plan. And then we need to resource that campaign plan. Let's just stay on that track, which we didn't invent for that war, and just, just do it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Sam, there is a question to you from Natalie. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so, of course, it would, uh, the, if wherever the line ends up being leaves Russia with less than it had before, that is desirable. I think the question for Ukraine, first and foremost, uh, and its partners who are deeply involved in assisting its, its war effort, is at what cost, right? And, and, at, you know, and how long will the war need to go on to achieve that outcome? Um, but just generally speaking, I don't think that there is a one-to-one -one correlation between territorial loss and willingness to make political concessions. I mean, we have some recent evidence. Again, Russia lost territory in the fall, and I haven't seen any you know, peace initiative coming out of Moscow as a result. So I just think that it's not a necessary um, you know, lose territory and therefore the politics change uh, and lead to a more... Um, you know, pliant uh, Kremlin that's willing to uh, make concessions. I, we haven't seen that so far. Uh, I certainly hope it materializes, but I don't think that you have this sort of one-to-one -one, uh, relationship between territorial control and, and that kind of political attitude. In fact, we know that in personalistic autocracies, leaders can even lose wars and remain in power. Um, uh, so uh, I'll just leave it at that. Sam, but let me ask a question. So what do you think brings Russia to the table? Well, I think if I had an answer to that question, you know, that, 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 that I think is the $64 million question, and I don't, I don't know that I have the answer to it. Um, but uh, I think that the, um, the, the question is, uh, well, I'm actually going to dodge that because I'm not sure that I can. Okay, we can, we can come back to it. We'll do a second round. If there is a person from Ukraine, I, I see a colleague from Ukraine, she gets to uh, jump the queue. Uh, so we'll do uh, Ed Lucas, um, Olena Holushka. Okay. Elena Holushka yes, from Ukraine. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. <coughs> yes, and yeah. I see you all. Then. So, um, I think Andrew's being very polite, so maybe I'll be a bit ruder. Um, the, the, there's a, a, I, I'm, I'm stunned by the West Bank. The Ukrainians have been right on this. The Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and Poles and others are right. And the, a large chunk of the Western analytic community just didn't listen. And they're still not listening. It's, you have a clear theory of victory, Andri, that military setbacks for the Russians lead to political change in Moscow. Sam, what gives you the confidence to say that's wrong? OK. Are you being impolite to any specific person, or you want? <laughs> OK. Uh, Elena, I, right here. Thank you very much. I basically have two questions, and both of them will go to Mr. Charab. The first one is, uh, did Western weapons make difference in Ukraine? And the second one, you're speaking a lot about the cost of fighting, you know, the line of fighting here and there. But uh, what is your analytical perspective on the cost of occupation? Because uh, if you take a look at, uh, at what is happening, uh, at all of the, the occupied territories. I mean, the patterns there are very similar. There are big mass graves, torture chambers, filtration camps, mass deportations, including the deportations of kids. All those things, they are happening particularly from the occupied territories. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could, <laughs> if, if you could pass on the mic to, uh, to James, just. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Perfect. We got it. Thank you. I almost share Sam Charap's premise that particularly experts and analysts need to think as objectively as they can about the range of possible outcomes. The fallacy in this is that we are not just observers, we are actors in this drama, and whether we conduct that exercise or not, um, we still have a responsibility to define our own national interests and objectives in this process. It's not, uh, we're, it, it's not a Brownian motion taking place. It's something we are shaping. I have one other point of skepticism for you, if I may. You mentioned that you said the Ukrainian army is not going to disintegrate, and the Russian army is not going to disintegrate. Why? Armies do disintegrate in war. You know as well as I that Russian armies have disintegrated in war. Why are you so confident that the Russian army will not disintegrate in this war? And just a final question, um, if I may. The, is not the issue, is, I, I put it as a question, isn't the, issue, isn't the false issue that the war will end in the sense of Russia's interests and Russia's intentions changing? Isn't the real issue that none of this will change, but that we could get to a stage where Russia no longer has the capacity to wage war at any scale that can threaten Ukraine's security or our own? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sam, it looks like it was Sam... Charup uh, round. So for the next one, if you can point, uh, if you can <laughs> let me know if you do not have question to Sam or, or Andre. No, I'm, I'm serious a little bit because I want to bring my other panelists as well, but uh, most of the questions were to you in this round. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with uh, Edward's question. Um, you know, uh, I see no evidence of imminent political change in Russia. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, and there are historical cases when personalist autocrats lose wars and remain in power. So there's no necessary, again, connection between losing a war and losing power. Um, so that, I think, uh, you know, it could happen, but there, there again, there's reason to, 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 uh, to question the automaticity of that outcome. Um, so why am I, uh, why, why do I have, uh, to James's question about uh, the future of the Russian military, we had a discussion in the panel just before this about uh, NATO's long-term capability needs um, and its own plans for <laughs> European security um, above and beyond Ukraine, which suggests to me that NATO planning is based on an assumption that the Russian military will not disappear. Um, and if you talk to you know, ministries of defense, they believe that the Russian military will continue to exist even after this war is over. So, I mean, I'm not the only one making that assumption, uh, I should just point out. And in terms of where the Russian military will be at the end of this and not have the capacity to pose a threat, I mean, it, it still will have thousands of nuclear weapons. I mean, I don't, like, that's not going to go away. That's true. But you, you, you posited an outcome where the Russian military cannot pose an existential threat to, um, you know, either Ukraine or NATO member states. And that just doesn't seem to me within the realm of the possible, unless you have a pathway to get from here to Russia denuclearizing. Um, I'd like to hear that. Great. I, I see Tara wants to jump in, Andre wants to jump in, and then we're going to do another round. Tara. What about my question? Would you like to... Uh, I give occupation, not territory. Occupation, not territory question. The I mean... Stuff. I don't know exactly how to answer that question, except to say, of course, I recognize that there are horrible uh, war crimes being committed under areas under Russian occupation. And it's ultimately for the Ukrainian government to decide which is worse, the casualties in, that could be, um, uh, uh, that could occur as a result of the continued fighting or the benefits of, of liberating more Russian territory, of more Ukrainian territory from Russian occupation. I mean, I, I don't know quite more, what more to say in answer to that question. Okay, Tara. Very briefly on our assumptions, what we got wrong, what we got right. Um, we didn't want to believe the intelligence when we saw it. Uh, people in my country in particular, but other countries as well, said it made no sense. It would not be rational for Putin to invade. We got this wrong. 
when ultimately he did, we thought that Kiev would fall in, in the span of three days, and it didn't. And so we're thinking a lot about this idea of escalation. I don't have an answer to that. But what I have seen in the past 15 months is that our assumption is also wrong when we think every time Putin loses a bit on the field, we think that it's going to lead him to come to the table, and actually he doubles down. And so when we're thinking about the counteroffensive and the F-16s <coughs> or the, the fighter jets, I think we should probably assume that he would double down. So how do we make sure that we get to a situation where he's not in a capacity to double down? Andre. Yes, very quick comment. Uh, mm -hmm. We should not indeed underestimate the threat that uh, the, uh, Putin may remain in power. Uh, let's just be realistic about this. For some time. I mean, we're obviously going to be doing whatever possible so he doesn't, he doesn't remain in power. But it's not necessarily that it, that will happen quickly. And obviously, uh, uh, as soon as we push them out, yes, they may be still having all these uh, aggressive uh, policies and, uh, and propaganda and so on and so on. Uh, the key thing is that, I think that's where we kind of a different opinion, is that for us that doesn't mean that our policy to the victory should be different. Mm -hmm. So yes, we understand the threats, yes, we understand the, the, the situation, and we understand that, that uh, indeed Russia is an is a existential threat, not just for us, but for all democratic communities, particularly in Eastern Europe. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be uh, very firm and very resolved about, uh, about uh, making them fail and keeping this until, until he uh, loses power. That's very simple. Thank you. Can I, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'd like just to comment briefly on what Ed Lucas said. He said the Poles and the Balts had it right, and we in the West, uh, uh, sort of Western <coughs> part of the European Union, didn't. Um, I would even go further. Uh, from Berlin, we would t tell Warsaw or Riga or, or Tallinn that yeah, they're actually being hysterical. Uh, it was it was <laughs> condescending. Yeah, you you were being polite. Uh, I just wanted to translate this into what it really was, um, uh, and 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 so I think uh, I think it's really important to, to recognize um, that that we have been wrong in the past and that we can be wrong again in in terms of our analyses. Uh, I actually like this discussion right now very much because the sobriety of Sam's analysis uh, goes so much against the grain of what we wish for. But um, I don't think that uh, the Putin regime you know, shows signs of disintegrating. I don't think that the uh, Russian army shows signs of disintegrating. Um, what we see uh, on the other hand, and that's I think very important, um, the, the Russian narrative about the war has changed. It's no longer about denazification and demilitarization or eliminating a fascist junta and all that, 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 that baloney from, from the outset. Now, when you listen to what, what, what uh, comes out of uh, Moscow, very often it is, well, we're actually defending the existence of Russia in the face of a NATO aggression. It's a completely different narrative. It's, it's, it's evolved over the last 15 months. <laughs> In that context, then, to keep NATO troops off Russian territory is in itself something that, that, that's positive in that kind of narrative. Why do I say this? Not because I agree with it, obviously not, but because we have, in the past, we have failed to take seriously what came out of Moscow, unlike Tallinn, Riga, Vilnius and Warsaw, who have taken seriously what came out of Moscow. We must get used to taking seriously what the Russian government says, even when, even when it's completely untrue, we cannot afford to ignore what they're saying. And I think, therefore, it's, it's, it's uh, important not to mix, and that's, that's the gist of this debate here this morning, um, is desirability and analysis should really be kept separate. Now, we have a responsibility to pursue a certain policy, we have a responsibility to act based on our national interests and our, our strategic desires, which is what we're doing. But that must be based on what we want and, and what we see in terms of an analysis. And I think that's, that's important to retain. Great. Thank you very much. I will try to squeeze two more rounds. And I, OK, I have Ben. I have a colleague from Riga. I have Daria. Oh, I have president. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, yes. Uh, so let's let's start with Ben. It's right there, uh, and then we'll come for the final one to the right side. Thanks very thanks very much, Michael. Uh, Benjamin Tallis, German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, and if you question, could point to the specific person, 
just yes. about to do exactly right. that. Um, <laughs> it is a question to Alexander Graf Lambsdorff, um, but other opinions on it would also be welcome. You, uh, you rightly said and gave some good examples uh, that Germany is changing, but is that change going fast enough and going far enough? Olaf Scholz has still not said that Ukraine should win. This hurts Ukraine. I think it also hurts Germany. But on every issue, from support to Ukraine, building a proper Bundeswehr, attitudes to Central Eastern Europe, contribution to European security, and facing down the threat of authoritarian regimes, what are the changes that you think still need to be made? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was a question from a colleague from Riga. Thank you so much, Lolita Sigan from uh, Riga, Latvia. I have a, a question to Ambassador Kent and to Tara about reconstruction and one particular aspect, and that is good governance and democratic governance aspect. Ukraine uh, now has a window of opportunity to push through some far-reaching democratic reforms, but it's not always going easy because of obvious factors. How could we help it to uh, do it more efficiently? Thank you. Great. Daria here. Daria Kaliniuk, Ukraine. I have a question to Alexander. Um, uh, in October last year, there was a security forum. We were brainstorming with Olena and other friends how to convince Germany to pass Ukraine Leo 2 tanks. So the Leo 2 coalition was formed, and uh, we are so happy that Germany is now transforming from the passive observer to her actual leader in Europe for security and for support of Ukraine. And now we are puzzled how to convince Americans to approve fighter jets. <laughs> And uh, we are here in uh, Estonia, we are mobilizing coalition of Nordic, uh, Baltic, Central Eastern European states uh, to convince Americans to approve the jets which Europe has, which Denmark has, which the Netherlands has, which Norway has, F-16s, and they don't need them. So can we count on Germany? Can we expect Olaf Scholz to call President Biden and ask him, well, uh, Joe, we can and we should commit to victory, so how about you just approve F-16s and we do the job, we deliver, and we pay for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you could pass forward to the professor of Tartu. <laughs> From Tartu. Thank you. Uh, I guess the question is for the, the four non-Ukrainians here. Uh, and my question is actually on the epistemology of, of um, deterrence, uh, which is, why, how do we know, based on what, do we base, or do we have this theory that we cannot escalate lest Russia will use nuclear weapons? I don't, have not seen anything other than threats. And those threats we take seriously from a man who otherwise fantasizes all kinds of things about the nature of what the world is about, mm -hmm. about Ukrainians, about Nazis, and then we get these threats. I mean, it seems kind of like masturbatory deterrence to me, <laughs> to coin a phrase. Um, phrase is coined, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Alexander, let's start with, with you. Yeah, well, Ben, uh, to answer your question, when you look at the three dimensions, uh, energy support to the Ukrainian armed forces and investment in the Bundeswehr, uh, I would say what is uh, going rather well is support to the Ukrainian armed forces. I mean, the package today is impressive by all standards. I mean, it's, it's really substantial. Where I think we are still lacking is, in terms of energy, a solid pathway. We have a very lively debate in Germany about the future of our energy policy. I'm not going to go into party politics here, but you know, switching off our last uh, nuclear power plants created a little bit of a debate in Germany. Some thought it was a good thing. Others, myself included, thought, well, not so smart. Um, but I think a, a solid energy policy is, is still uh, not there. And, and I'll, I'll be very blunt about this, uh, now the commitment to the Bundeswehr with the, with the 100 billion euros over a couple of years is one thing, but they will be used up one day. And will our defense budget at that point be at 2%? Will it be at where our NATO commitment is? That is also still missing in terms of a solid pathway, in terms of medium-term financial planning. So I think on, 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 on one count we are really good, on two other counts uh, the Jury is still out on, on, on whether the Zeitenwende is actually really going to transform Germany in a, in a, in a lasting way. Um, on Daria, <laughs> on, 
on, on airplanes. I said on the package today, it didn't even create a fuss. The MiG-29s that went from Poland to Ukraine used to be part of the GDRs of East Germany's army, so Germany had to, you know, approve it. I think it took all of 36 hours. I mean, it's, it was, it, nobody even sort of, you know, thought about even debating it. Um, it was, the, 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 the uh, request came from Warsaw, pop, 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 and the permission was granted, no fuss there at all. So I think, uh, as I said, that's the part of the first part, the support to Ukraine, it's working well. Um, as far as uh, convincing uh, the, 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 the American president of, of, of doing things that, that he might be reluctant to do, we have an example of that, which is the uh, example of the main battle tanks. When we decided we were going to give the Leopard uh, 2, it was only after the Chancellor had secured a commitment from the American side that M1 Abrams uh, tanks would all, were, were also going to go. And I think that is really crucial okay. because uh, 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 when you look at the coalition agreement and when you look at the, at the practical policies of the German government, it's extremely Atlanticist. It's extremely focused on keeping the alliance together in terms of burden sharing, 100 billion, but also in terms of risk sharing. So I would expect any such discussion to be uh, head uh, across the Atlantic. I'm not privy to any one you know, taking place at this particular point in time, but I think there is an openness to debate these things really without reservation. Thank you. Ambassador and Tara is on reconstruction, perhaps. The reconstruction, obviously, it's a massive undertaking. I wish uh, uh, Professor McFalls uh, and others' views of just taking the seized assets and starting to pay for the first 300 billion would work out in the short term. Regardless of where the funding is, I think the conditionality is key. G7 is likely to be the mechanism through which the coordination happens. There needs to be deep international involvement because we're going to be talking about tens and hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, and uh, I think then on the international side, there has to be the willingness to suspend if there is misallocation of resources. But I think the seven steps towards the EU uh, are the first, if you will, guardrails, uh, ensuring that particularly in the justice sector, uh, which is one of the last vestiges of the Soviet system of control of citizens, is turned into a true system of justice that serves the citizens that will both improve what Ukrainians have been fighting for domestically and dying for 30 years, uh, and it will get them closer to the EU. So I think it's a combination of the push of people like Daria and Olga and Elena uh, and in cooperation with those of us in the room. My guess is it will land... Uh, uh, via the G7 and World Bank, but again, there will have to be very clear benchmarks and conditionalities and willingness to suspend if progress is not made. Thank you. Fully agree with what the ambassador said. I think the EU, the EU now has offered candidate uh, status to the accession, and so it's going to be a long, long way uh, to get there. Judicial reform, economic reform, uh, anti-corruption as well. There are a number of pathways that, that Ukraine will have to follow, but the whole point of the process is, is that the EU is accompanying the process and, and there is a large review. So I think that is absolutely essential. G7 and international cooperation and funding as well. Uh, you have also countries from the rest of the world who do want to participate in the reconstruction of Ukraine. So it's, a, it's an American question, it's a European question, but you see it a lot of interest from countries in Asia too in participating in this. So I think the larger the effort, the, the, the more important, but then on really the political and the good governance side of things, the EU has, has a very clear pathway that, uh, that Ukraine will have to follow. They'll have to do this uh, in combination. And we will have to reform our agricultural policies, but that's another matter. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take one more round, but would anyone like to answer also President's question, uh, Professor's question yeah. on uh, uh, self-deterrence, let's put it this way. I yes. think there are a lot of people who probably graduated from the same universities that we did, Tartu and other universities, uh, who over the years have mistaken escalation and deterrence. And I think people need to understand, I think most of the people in this room understand that when you have a bully, you stand up. And if you don't deter, you find yourself in an escalation cycle, not of your own choosing. So I think that misunderstanding fundamentally is oftentimes a self-constraint that then forces future action. Okay, thank you very much. Charles has been very patient, uh, Charles Grant, uh, and we will try to take, okay. Great. I have a question for Alexander. In his opening remarks, he talked about the near consensus in Germany that Ukraine should join the European Union. But the position of your government and the French government is that no EU expansion can occur without majority voting being introduced on foreign policy and taxation. 
from my own conversations, I think that's highly unlikely. So is that, in fact, going to prevent Ukraine joining the EU? Or if, as one official said to me in Berlin last week, maybe we're a bit less hardline than the French. Because we have morally driven politicians, maybe the Germans could go soft on that conditionality. What do you think? Thank you very much. Andrew Michta, if you could pass on. And then with the final question. And that will be it, unfortunately. Yes, I know. I know. Ah. Eight minutes. Thank you, Andrew Mikla, Marshall Center. Thank you for a fascinating conversation. Question mainly to Alexander. Uh, as we talk about EU enlargement uh, and full appreciation of the changes I see in German strategic culture, it's my second tour in Germany right now. But it seems to me that we're actually putting the cart before the horse. Any reconstruction of Ukraine, any EU membership talk is dependent on ensuring that Ukraine is secure. Cost of reconstruction has to include the cost of standing up and supporting Ukrainian military strong enough yep. to deter and, if need be, defend itself. The current Ukrainian military is the strongest army in Europe, but it's not sustainable considering the mix of equipment. So the costs of just changing all of that, streamlining and all of that, the rest of it. Why so, why so much reluctance about using the N-word for Ukraine, NATO membership? I mean, look at our Finnish friends. Look at our Swedish friends. They clearly communicated being a partner is not enough. A senior German politician told me the other day that yes, we'll secure Ukraine within the NATO structure somewhat, somehow. Why are we doing this to ourselves? This is a country that is fighting. This is a system transforming war. It's fighting for all of us. There's no going back to the way the systemic arrangements were in Europe. A successful and secure Ukraine ensures that Belarus will eventually implode as well, and there will be a regional solution to the crisis dilemma in the crash zone of Europe. Why don't we have more courage to move forward on this? And it's mainly to you because of the weight that Germany has in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> and a final question goes to the colleague there in the center. Hi, Katarzyna Szafariko, I'm a Czech correspondent in Brussels. I have a question on the uh, accession of Ukraine to the EU. So it's a little bit on like follow up to what, what has been asked just now. The question is this one and it's to Mr. Lambsdorff. Will your chancellor raise hand in favor of Ukraine starting accession negotiation by the end of this year? And if the answer is yes, will you then, will he then negotiate or try to persuade his colleagues, for example, Mr. Rutte, to do the same thing despite Dutch farmers' uh, requests kicking in and despite, despite many other sort of uh, reasons of skepticism kicking in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, five minutes, 40 seconds, starting with Alexander, and then let's come this way addressing any questions or final statement you would like mm -hmm. to make. Alexander. Okay, a couple, couple of issues. There's, there's a number of obstacles, and, and again, desirability analysis. I'm on the analysis side now, okay? There's a couple of obstacles that need to be cleared before Ukraine can join the European Union. One is indeed the issue of majority voting. Uh, I, I believe, we believe that majority voting in CFSP is an is absolute requirement for this uh, 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 body of, of now 27 soon possibly 35 uh, uh, countries to act jointly together. I know that people here in Estonia have a different view on this, but I believe it's, it's an obstacle that needs to be cleared. Second uh, thing is uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, I mean, Poland just recently noticed that they have grain in Ukraine. Uh, and, Ukraine grain. Uh, and, and the Polish uh, uh, debate on, on, on this is, is, is one that I've flabbergasted everybody because I mean, Hungary and, 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 and Poland now stopped Ukrainian grain imports because of their, 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 their agricultural uh, uh, um, producers themselves, the, the, the peasants. So I think there's a number of uh, obstacles that need to be cleared. Um, and uh, uh, there's one other obstacle, and that is, or obstacle, I'd say, I'd say hurdle. Of course, the countries of the Western Balkans have been in negotiations for a long time. And the Western Balkans is also on the agenda of many policymakers, including the Chancellor. If you read the speech that he gave in Prague, it's very clear that he, uh, you know, he has a very clear commitment to Ukraine, but he doesn't forget the Western Balkans because of that. So, long story short, as with all other candidates in the past, EU membership as a prospect is important politically, but in, in practical terms, it will require a lot of hurdles. It will be require a lot of people to, as we say in German, jump 
across their own shadow. <laughs> so so to, 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 go, to go places where they haven't been in the past. For example, uh, majority voting and taxation. Many people in Germany are extremely skeptical about that. Maybe we'll have to look at that position again. Majority voting in CFSP. Many people in Estonia are skeptical about that. Maybe they'll have to look at that again. So this is, this is what I'm saying here so for, to our Ukrainian friends. Um, it's, 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 it's a process. It's a process. Um, and I disagree with the fact that reconstruction and, and, and NATO membership, that this, is, this, this would be a sequencing. Reconstruction is happening as we speak, as Ukraine is fighting. Reconstruction is taking place are following attacks on, on, on electricity generation uh, uh, and, and everybody supporting that. So I don't see that contradiction between you know, investing in reconstruction in Ukraine while Ukraine is still fighting. I, I, I don't think that uh, is a contradiction. Let me go to Andre. Yes, thank you. So uh, let me tell two things I would like to say uh, as a conclusion. So first of all, I'd like to tell you when Ukraine becomes a member of NATO. Uh, Ukraine becomes a member of NATO when NATO countries realize that this is not about Ukraine getting into NATO, but it's about securing the uh, stability in Eastern Europe. And when they become strategic about that, then when they realize like, what it takes to actually secure the stability in Eastern Europe, then they design a, a construct in which Ukraine would be a natural part of it. And uh, since there is no better uh, alliance than NATO, uh, that would be NATO. It would be like a, a natural progression of NATO response to the threats when, when the countries will finally understand that the threats are real, the threats are, uh, are quite large, and the mass matters, like too many soldiers uh, coming from Russia, you know, threatening, uh, to, like serious uh, amount of equipment, like lots of weapons, etc., etc. So Europe needs to have a very strong force right there. Not expect when it flies from the United States, because it takes time, as we all know, as we will see right now, but actually be there in Eastern Europe, ready at any point of time to defend Eastern Europe from, 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 from the threat. And as soon as that realization comes to the policymakers and, uh, and, uh, and, and military personnel, the question will not be about whether Ukraine has to be or not. The question would be like how we can arrange it so it, so, so it, so it become effective. So that's the first thing. Second thing, same thing about the planes or tanks or something like that. To be honest, it's not very uh, normal that we are asking for uh, some specific parts of the overall combined capability. So like in the military environment, people don't do that. I mean, in a military environment, people are saying, what would it take to make Russia fail? What would it take that campaign becomes successful? And then, and then naturally, you would not imagine talking to any NATO military person and saying, can you fight Russia, but you don't have planes. Just like imagine this, like, and, and then take planes out of the equation, you know. And they do. So Russians do have planes, and they use them actively, and so on, and so on but you don't. And then try to devise the campaign plan without that. And then, obviously, any men, mil, NATO military said, well, it's impossible. Let's have planes. So again, we, we don't want to run after the uh, ministers of defense asking for a planes. What we, what we would like to suggest is to have a, a single strategic plan. How do we succeed in that war? And then everything else comes as a consequence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tara. Yes. Maybe to the professor's question as well earlier. Um, in thinking about escalation and deterrence, uh, in a way, we, I would say, let's say Western Europeans, we keep thinking that when Putin acts or doubles down, as I said earlier, we bear the burden of responsibility for his, for his action. I don't understand why this still eludes me, but I think we still feel this. So every time we're a bit, you know, we want to be more prudent because we wouldn't want Putin to do something. But Putin is the one who decided to invade Ukraine. Putin is the one who is doubling down every time he's pushed back. And I think we should assume that he will continue pushing back and, and, and doubling down. And so I think as, as long as we don't liberate ourselves from this burden of responsibility of his actions or what he could do potentially, then it's going to be hard for us. And we still want to help Ukraine as much as possible, but we really need, you know, need to liberate ourselves from that because we are not responsible for what he is doing. We are responsible for our actions and how we reply to that. But, but what Putin is doing is Putin's responsibility and Putin's fault. Thank you very much. Sam, would you like to jump in Good. for the final ambassador? The quote is from Sergei Zhidan, the uh, most popular contemporary Ukrainian poet. He's from what many people call Eastern Ukraine. Uh, he was born in Slobodanshina, Luhansk province, grew up in Kharkiv. What Ukrainians are dying for is they are forging their freedom in the crucible of war. What they're living for is for a better country. 
that's getting rid of the last vestiges of Soviet power and creating uh, the true promise of being a European country because Ukraine is Europe just as Crimea is Ukraine. This is a, really a perfect way to finish our conversation. And I, I'm there to say that I think we actually made a number of steps toward the, the goal, the vision, the, the, uh, the challenge that Timothy gordon put before uh, us. And I think there is a bit of uh, believing in, the, in, in this uh, and then fulfilling the strategic vision that we have uh, ahead of us. And we are here all in this room, part of this, part of this work. So uh, good work, everyone. And most importantly, please join me in thanking our excellent panelists. And enjoy lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.